It's happening, people. It isn't a drill. Live onto the PTR is Blizzard's attempt to address this meta. But also as well, Josh No made a final forum post apologizing for the miscommunication and triggering so many Overwatch fans, including myself somewhat. So after the patch notes, we will set the record straight and highlight really how cool Josh No has been through all of this. He's a great guy. I'm a big fan. But although, of course, we appreciate his words, the actions speak even louder. Live onto the PTR now, kicking it off with Batiste Immortality Field Maximum Duration Reduced from 8 seconds to 5. The cooldown has been increased from 20 seconds to 25. And Amplification Matrix Ultimate Cost has increased by 20%. Now, something that I always like to bring up when there is just straight up cost and cooldown nerfs is that the impact of all of these abilities more or less is going to stay the same, but the rate that you get them and how often they're up is all going down. You'll probably feel the amplification matrix nerf because you used to be able to get it in like, I don't know, 10 seconds or something if you healed your whole team properly. You'll have to add on a precious couple extra seconds to that more than likely in order to get your ultimate, but it's still going to charge pretty darn fast, I think. The biggest nerf among the three, I think, is the duration of the drone being out going down from eight seconds to five. That, I feel, is a pretty massive nerf because how many times are you stuck in a team fight trying to focus a target, but then they step into the radius of the lamp and it's just behind a shield or behind some cover or something like that, and it just lingers a little bit too long for you to be able to make an impact. I think that's massively changed now, and the area you would expect it to see the biggest buffs is to characters that want to engage into that immortality field. A guy like Winston, whose timing on those dives is so crucial, because think about it, if a tool that a dive-esque hero uses to sustain themselves in that fight, like Bubble, rivals the uptime of lamp a bit better than when those two come head to head there's a bigger window for the engaged character to actually be able to make a play into the field which i would argue at most ranks didn't feel too hard but at the highest ranks of course where lamps are getting placed perfectly around corners every time that's where you're going to start to see and especially with a lot of these changes there's going to be a bigger gap increasing where some heroes are catching the nerf stick in order to pull them back at the higher levels where I think they're performing averagely at most levels. So that high tier, low tier dichotomy is probably going to get more split up as we go through the patch notes here. Next up is May, whose endothermic blaster slowing effect now reduces the enemy movement speed from 20 to 70, where it used to be 30 to 90. And the slowing effect duration reduced from one and a half second to one second. That's the amount of time that you are under the slowdown effect once it hits you. Characters that care about that a lot are Genji, Wrecking Ball, Winston as well. And that's really key because May's ability to just quickly sideswipe one of these dive characters and begin to slow them actually snowballed her ability to complete a full freeze. If a character with mobility like Genji jumping above Mei is able to shake off some of that chilling effect, dive characters in theory could have a better chance up against Satan herself, aka Mei. The overall move speed reduction, because they don't lay out all of the figures of this, it's something that we're going to have to test to actually get the full feel for. Of course, Mei freeze hits you, and the longer it hits you, the increased effect the slow has over time so it used to be 30 percent instantly to 90 now the range is from 20 to 70 down by 10 and 20 at both ends of the spectrum testing will be required but there's a very distinct interaction especially with a character like wrecking ball where he needs his momentum to be able to fireball rolling through the enemy team and the way it is on live anyway a passing glance of endothermic blaster freeze ray basically stops him entirely and there's a chance now that he'll be able to continue to escape rather than be full on cc'd i'm not sure if this is enough all in all but i would say is quite the classic style blizzard nerf as much griping we've all been giving blizzard about things what they don't do to their game is overcorrect in a massive way consistently once in a while they do that but most of the time they very gradually change things over time and this is another one of those things where it's not like May's losing a lot of her best tools, sustainability, ranged fall off, incredible ultimate. It's the god tier level of the super freeze ray, which is going down a bit, but she still has multi freeze, which is really good. 
talked about this with Sam Edel recently, but when you catch the whole team in a halt and May freezes them, it's the same value as her ultimate. That's the crazy thing. It doesn't feel that difficult to do, which is the reason why I wish it would go back to just one target at a time, but we'll see how this pans out. Next up is D.Va, who did get the previously mentioned booster's cooldown reduction. It used to be five, now it's going down to three. This will allow D.Va to go in and out of the battle much quicker, and especially with May going down a bit, the interplay between D.Va being in the fight and May trying to just destroy D.Va by disabling her completely might be a bit better. I just played a game on Ranked earlier today where the enemy was playing D.Va, and granted, they still lost, but D.Va's the type of character that can dodge a lot of May's value. You try to wall her off, she just flies away. May's ultimate announces itself before it comes out, meaning D.Va has the ability to eat it. But despite those potential strengths, D.Va was overall losing the matchup to May most of the time, on the live patch anyway. But now with the freeze ray being a bit worse and D.Va's mobility being a bit more frequent and for immortality field going down a bit, we'll have to test to see if dive play styles are a bit better up against the current 1.43 meta composition. Next up is quite the cupcake nerf to Orisa, fortify damage reduction goes down from 50% to 40. Oh no, it's only 10% worse than Nano Boost on a cooldown. Now the thing with Orisa that's really going to change her top meta spot, I think, is Halt, or the interaction between D.Va and Halt. The secret is, if D.Va becomes good, Halt becomes a lot worse. Now it's the best thing in the game. Just confirms kills way too reliably. Protects your whole team, does a million different things. You're not going to notice this fortify nerf except when, I think, except when damage amp is involved. So especially Zenyatta Discord Orb. Zenyatta's Discord applies 25% damage amplification. So now the difference you have to play with goes from 25% leftover reduction down to 15. And there's other things as well to think about. Nano boost is 50%, Mercy Beam's 30, Ant Matrix is 100. So keep that in mind when you're trying to decide if you can focus fire or Risa or not. My assumption is that the devs think that Halt doesn't need to be nerfed yet because Immortality Field and May are getting knocked down a peg. So because of that, they're keeping Orisa's ability to make her big play quite easily, I might add. But the supporting cast that keeps themselves alive are going down considerably, meaning that ignoring Orisa and killing her team should see a buff on this next patch. Which, mind you, was the reason why a character like Reinhardt wasn't very good in the dive era. Much different game now, but having a tank that can't reposition to deal with mobility attacking your team, well, we've seen that be an issue for a character in the past. Next up, Hanzo. Primary fire, maximum projectile speed reduced from 125 to 110. I assume this number is intended to be meters per second, but the confusing thing is on the Gamepedia, for Overwatch, Hanzo's is listed at 100 meters per second, so I don't know if there's some conversion here or just a typo on that regard. For reference, Farah shoots her rockets that fly at 35 meters per second, and Zenyatta's are 90. So for the moment anyway, let's just assume that it's a 15 meters per second nerf. What does this matter for? Well, because he still has Storm Arrow for consistent damage on zippy targets and Lunge retains its full power, his interactions up against getting Dove don't change too much. What will matter is the long-range battle up against Widowmaker and probably especially Farah. Widow, she's super slow when you're in a scope-up battle against her anyway, so that one maybe a little bit less or so, but especially hitting mid-airs against Farah as she's flying through the sky is probably going to see a change in that duel. There's so many insane hit scans in the game anyway, though. It's not like Farah's just going to be an easy character, but I think that matchup just falls a little bit for Hanzo. Keep in mind, his Storm Arrow, as listed on Gamepedia, also had 100 meters per second. But either way, I would assume either the Storm Arrows also are getting nerfed to this value because the thought process was that a Storm Arrow is supposed to fire like a primary arrow at full charge, doing less damage, of course. But without it listed, it's either an oversight or they're going to let Storm Arrow be a faster projectile than even the primary fire is, which would be kind of interesting if they go that route. Last nerf of the day is Doomfist, uppercut, recovery time, increased from 
0.2 seconds to 0.5 seconds. Recovery time is the delay in between your ability to do your next action. Very important when diving like a Zenyatta, uppercutting him into the sky and being close enough to set up for easy hand cannon follow-up shots. With a bigger delay, there's more wiggle room for the target to either escape or to make the shots harder as they veer away from you flying through the sky. I think recovery time is just for the follow-up shots, but if it's for abilities as well, it may slow down the pacing of the character. But I think it's just for the fire rate though, but I could be wrong on that. With that all out of the way, I wanted to proceed on to Josh No's final post that came late yesterday. And this is what the nice guy had to say. Hey, thanks for clarifying this. I'm definitely hearing a ton of feedback over the last day, and I'm learning a bunch from this experience. I came to share my personal viewpoint, listen to the community, and try to make the game better together. I'm truly not attempting to callously disregard anyone's concerns and say everything is fine. I'm aware there are distinct increases in power across several aspects of the game. Well, let me just, let me just read that again. I'm aware there are distinct increases in power across several aspects of the game. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, <laughs> I'm actually working myself up to tears. I don't know what that says about me, but maybe I'm just a tremendous voice actor. But finishing his post now, distinct increases of power across several aspects of the game, such as raw healing input, the introduction of new heroes and mechanics, or things like Wrecking Ball's extreme mobility. I don't think this is inherently negative, as balance is relative across a large number of factors. There have also been losses of power, such as the recent barrier changes. Yes, and we're all a big fan of those. More of that, please. The idea I was trying to express, and failed to clearly, is that I don't personally feel like there is an unreasonable amount of excessive power creep that makes the core gameplay not feel like Overwatch anymore. For example, Goat's Comp was getting in that space for me, not necessarily due to individual hero power increases, but from the combined synergy of the comp moving away from feeling like a shooter. Here's the thing. And I had to cut a section out of the video yesterday in order to account for all the different re-edits and posts, but something I wanted to say in yesterday's video that maybe would have framed my comments in a better light is that I know Josh Snow is a brilliant guy, a high-level player. He's in GM. He cares about a lot of the top-down skill-based balancing that many of us want as well. He's on our team. So I apologize if I made it seem like I didn't know that or reading too much into a statement by the developers. Hopping onto the forums isn't really the same thing as a press release or something, but we in the community only get that, so we kind of treat it like it is. But at the same time, it's just video games. Even if we did disagree, it's not the end of the world. But I happen to know that Josh probably agrees with a lot of the criticisms that were tossed his way, but was more so just trying to pop in yesterday and the day before to say like things are more complicated than you think and there's always these wacky statistical outliers that would probably surprise you if you took a close look at the data we start to talk about characters like soldier or genji being a lot better than people think as i said in yesterday's video i largely agree with a lot of those statements but what gets a lot of us annoyed is we know the truth of how much extra effort you have to put into that genji play to get that win rate to be anywhere similar to the easier characters that do it for free and you probably should just be playing them instead right that's the real issue yes if you really put in the work and perform to a certain level, you can get kind of comparable results if the best players in that tier just grind out that hero. But that doesn't really accurately represent how that hero performs or what it's like to play with that hero on your team and the slack the rest of the team have to pick up in order to get that pick to work. Despite my whining, I want to say for like a third time now in two videos, I prefer the slow approach Blizzard takes with these things. But let me be clear, it's a bit too slow, but I'm fully aware that it's much easier to further break the game quickly with the big nerfs people would like to see. If they made these small nerfs faster, I think that would work better. They take too long to do them, but the way that they've been going with this PTR patch is a very gradual exchange of power to try to get other playstyles to work. And frankly, outside of the top level, a ton of playstyles already work. The game's already pretty well balanced for most players. It's the high level community that ruins it for the rest of us. And they don't want to just overcompensate for them and then ruin it for everybody else instead. Like that's not the goal. So I'm happy with the severity of nerfs when they do come, 
I just think picking up the pace with the testing of it would be nice. So with that and a smile on my face, Josh Snow with a killer post to put a lovely little bow on the miscommunication of the previous ones and a new PTR to test out. I'm a happy guy. If you are as well, or gal, of course, please be sure to leave the video a like. It really does help us out and lets us know that you're enjoying the content. And if you haven't already, please subscribe and hit the bell icon so that you actually get notified when our videos go live. Link to the description is our Twitter where we tweet out news updates and dank memes. Go hit us a follow on there. That's been it for me. I've been Frito for your Overwatch. We'll see you guys next time.